So you said that you can look to God for wisdom to make sense of the world. There's a lot of stuff to us humans that's difficult to make sense of, um, like you losing your mother. Uh, there's a lot of cruelty in the world. There's a lot of suffering in the world. Uh, what wisdom uh, have you been able to find uh, from God about about why there is suffering in the world, why there's cruelty? You know, there's a saying that I wanted to ask God about why he allows hunger and war and poverty, but I was afraid he might ask me the same question. <laughs> God has certainly given us enough food. There's enough food in the world for everyone to have a 3,200 calorie diet a day. Uh, God has certainly given us enough guidance uh, for us to not inflict on each other the cruelty that we inflict. When we look to the world around us, first and foremost, we have to have a sense of accountability. We are accountable for our own actions. We don't blame God for the evil of man. That's one. But at the same time, we understand that God in his wisdom allows for certain outcomes that we cannot encompass with our own. And that to isolate these incidents and to try to make sense of them is no different than a baby in the womb that doesn't understand the world that it's coming into and trying to explain to that baby that hasn't yet developed its own senses and its own perception of this world what is happening to it right you know i often think of the example of a child and you know having uh been at this point now through the experience of parenthood i'm still learning uh, i'm just going into having a teenager uh with three kids and being a softie for my kids you know when you have to tell your child that they can't have something that they really really want and that child thinks you hate them at some point, you know, because why are you stopping me from putting this toy in my mouth <laughs> and choking me myself? Uh, they don't get it, right? But at the same time, you prevent them out of love. They're not in a position to understand that you're preventing them out of love. And to isolate these incidents with God and to say, the wisdom, what's the wisdom? Uh, you're trying to make sense of a pixel when you can't see the bigger picture. Your mind is not at a place where you can make sense of the bigger picture. You haven't seen the bigger picture. And so for him to even explain to us every incident uh, would completely defeat the purpose of putting your trust in him. So we believe in a God that is all-encompassing in his knowledge and wisdom that gives us, and Islam is very you know, specific by the way, that there is what God tells us to do and there's what God allows to happen. So what God tells us to do in terms of the roadmap towards good and then what God allows to happen in his divine wisdom, that no outcome can escape him, but at the same time, we are accountable for our own actions and our own deeds. So when you come to someone and you say, you know, why did God allow this to happen to this person? I can't rationalize that for you because my understanding is relegated to the immediate experience in front of me. But if I know God, and if I learn about God, then I don't have to make sense of the plan, but I can tell you that I trust the planner. And I think that that's where peace is found. You know, a lot of times you look for the light at the end of the tunnel. What's the light at the end of the tunnel? In Islam, there's emphasis on God and the hereafter. Because to try to make sense of uh, divine decree and why certain things happen in this world without the existence of a God or without the existence of a hereafter will always fail you. So the existence of a God that is all knowing what we don't know, I know what you don't know, that understands what we don't understand. The existence of a God who is not subject to our constrictions and the existence of a hereafter where all things find recourse, where there's divine recourse, uh, allows for this world to be situated within the existence of something greater and not treated in isolation. So when you're trying to treat an incident of this world in isolation, you're going to fail. And when you try to treat existence in this world and of this world in isolation, you're also going to fail. And so the emphasis is the belief in God. 
a God that is not limited like you are, and a belief in the hereafter that is not limited like this life. And so everything continues onwards and there is divine recourse for everything, each and everything. You know, the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, mentions that on the day of judgment, a person who lived the most difficult of lives will be dipped into paradise one time and will be told, have you ever seen any sadness, any hardship? Now, when you think about the most difficult life, some of the commentators uh, in Islam, they said that uh, this is perhaps referring to the prophet Job, Ayyub, peace be upon him, because Job lived obviously a life of great difficulty, but that a person who lived a very hard life would be dipped into paradise one time. And just with a dip be asked, have you ever seen any hardship? Have you ever seen any misery? And that person would say, what is sadness? What is hardship? What is misery? Now, if you don't believe in the hereafter, if you don't believe in anything beyond this life, then the recourse has to happen in this life. And because we see so many people pass through this life without recourse of cruelty, without recourse of suffering, then we're forced to try to make sense of it. And if you are someone who believes that this entire world came into existence through uh, randomness, that we're just an existence of random atoms that collide with each other and that all of this comes together out of nothing, then how can you put your trust in anything that is greater? So as a, you know, you asked me as a, as a child of, of a parent who suffered, I believe that every moment that my mother uh, suffered, that she will be rewarded, that she will be elevated, that all of that made her or contributed to the beautiful person that she was and will contribute to the beautiful reward that she receives and the recourse is certain to me as a believer in that. So the right approach to making sense of the world, especially making sense of suffering and cruelty is that of humility, that we as humans cannot possibly understand fully. Absolutely. In fact, in the Quran, it's very interesting. When God creates Adam, the angels say to God, are you going to create uh, a race or a species that will spill blood and cause corruption? And God says to the angels in response to that question, I know that which you don't know. So even the angels have to humble themselves for a moment. The angels who adore God, who love God, who worship him, who obey him unconditionally, they are told by God, I know that which you don't know. And what we extract from that, what many of the uh, early interpretations extract from that is that God knows that there are human beings that will come out of this enterprise of humanity that make the entire existence of it worth it. And so just as, yes, there will be criminals and corrupt ones, there will be prophets and beautiful people that come out of this and sages and saints that come out of this that show that a human being who, unlike an angel who has no choice but to worship God, an angel has no sense of will, no sense of choice, an angel is created to worship and has no desires. A human being who has the choice of desire and worship, the choice of righteousness and wickedness, that there are human beings who will choose worship and righteousness, that will choose charity over cruelty, that will choose service and choose dedication and devotion over death and destruction, that there are human beings that will in fact ascend the angels in rank because they will live lives where they choose that capacity, that part of themselves, and they lean into that and worship God lovingly and obey him. You see, in some of the sages in Islam, scholars, they describe this as saying that the human being has the capacity to be anywhere from an animal to an angel, or even worse, to be a devil <laughs> you know, to an angel. Not in the sense that we ever actually become angels or become animals, but that an animal, you know, for the most part, seeks its desires over everything, doesn't really think about, you know, many of the things that we are supposed to calculate as human beings, doesn't think about which territory it's infringing upon or, you know, how much of its appetite it should fulfill. It simply exists to fulfill its appetite and that many human beings simply exist to fulfill their appetite and they choose that over worship or reason or anything that is greater. Just, they, they literally take their selves as gods in that sense and they're 
cells have no limitation on appetite. So they just keep filling that appetite and filling that appetite and filling that appetite. Whereas a human being can also go to the extent of choosing something greater and disciplining their desires, disciplining their selves because they're seeking a greater reward. You know, we know many people that achieve great things in the worldly sense because they choose to study over sleep, for example. They choose to exert themselves towards their careers, towards their education, because they believe that ultimately the outcome of those pursuits are more rewarding than the immediate fulfillment of their desires. So as believers, we choose that love of God and we choose that outcome that we seek and we discipline ourselves to where we can even ascend past the angels in rank. Now, of course, I said we can go as low as an animal or even as low as a devil. And we have tyrants, past and present and future as well, that can become satanic in their nature because they allow their desires to take such control over them that they not only worship them, but that every other existing being around them simply becomes a piece of their own puzzle and pursuit of their own lordship and their own satisfaction. They will kill, they will discard. Not because, you know, and I always say this, it's not that tyrants uh, necessarily like killing people. It's that people's lives uh, pose somewhat of an, you know, an indifference to them. They're indifferent to people's existence. And so you become either an object for or against me. And so they're willing to discard children, discard people, discard the rights of others because they ultimately have chosen that the greatest pursuit for, of, of themselves is the maximum position of power and, and a place to where they can fulfill what they want to of themselves without any limits. And every everyone else becomes either a threat or an opportunity in that regard. So we're, we can be devils, we can be angelic-like, we can be animals. We're somewhere on that spectrum. And every moment contains a set of choices you can make. Absolutely. Every single moment contains a set of choices. And that's where the intentionality comes in, right? So the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, says that I saw a person strolling in paradise because he removed something harmful from the road. Uh, he tells us about a woman that lived a life in prostitution, but that repented to God when she was thirsty one day and she saw a dog that was also thirsty. And she said that I was thirsty and God gave me water. So I'm going to choose to give water to that thirsty dog. And God enters her into paradise as a result of that. Sometimes the small moments with a small sincere deed can have a huge impact on a person's trajectory. So every moment is a moment of choices. And when we choose belief, righteousness, a pursuit of something greater, then we find ways to turn things that are otherwise mundane into miraculous acts, right? Where we can we can choose God over ourselves and in the process, choose a better fate for ourselves.